Okay, so um, welcome back. So the topic today is why does diets fail and how can we successfully lose weight? So, you know, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago and I'm going to recap what we said and then we can get into the details of how you can avoid it. And I'm going to tell you 10 points and um, that's going to completely change your uh, thought process. So let's get back to why diets fail. By the way, I'm Dr. Rajeshwaran, consultant endocrinologist and bariatric physician working in the UK. And I've been doing this job for nearly 20 years now. So it's a fascinating field and a fast developing field. So um, I train a lot of doctors and uh, help them and teach them that the responsibility of helping people to lose weight is ours. You can't put the blame on anyone. So the blame, when the responsibility is on the doctors, that's what I'm trying to say. So what you need to do is you need to find out the why. I've uh, repeated this several times. You need to know why. Forget about the what, you know? It's just like moving away from the industrial revolution in, into information technology. 100 years ago, it was all about industrial revolution. And these days, it's all about tech, it's information. How fast can you get the information? How fast your app works? So that's how it's changed. Similarly, in weight management, it's moved in the last 30, 40 years from the what to the why. So you need to find out why are you doing what you're doing? Why can't you lose weight? And that's the key. And that's the, what I'm going to talk about. So you won't, me, you won't find me uh, providing recipes and I'm going, not going to talk to you about any fancy diets or the Mediterranean diet or uh, Ukrainian diet. I'm not going to talk to you all about diets um, which can help you lose weight. It's all about the why. Okay, so to recap, the top five reasons why diets fail. The first one is we follow the crowd. So your uncle, aunt, friends, anyone doing a diet, you go and jump into it. You see this on the Daily Mail, the tabloids. Some doctor claims that this diet is the one which is trending on Twitter. You jump for it. So following the crowd. The reason is you don't even analyze. Is it really suitable to you? Or are you just falling for the before and after pictures? What exactly happened before and after? No one knows. And have you ever seen sometimes after? And it's very critical. There's a, a TV program called The Biggest Loser. I don't know if you've seen that. It's a US-based program, but then it was there in the UK as well. So if you looked at all the people who won, those who did really well, and they lost a lot of weight and they won the prize money. If you look at the impact on their life after they won, it's sad. A lot of them put back weight, they were depressed, and um, they felt that they were exposed. So they did well because there was pressure on them by the television, by the camera. So please do not follow the crowd. Do it for yourself. You are the most important person, so you should do it for yourself. The second point we discussed was why we are always in search of quick returns. We want it tomorrow. You know, you must have been putting on weight five stones in say 10 years. And now you say, okay, I really want to lose weight next week because there's a marriage coming up. So we want quick returns. And when you want quick returns, obviously you will find people who are selling quick returns. And that's where we get caught. So you need to understand as a human body, it takes time to put on weight. Similarly, it will take time to lose weight. If you lose weight quickly, you'll put it as fast as you lose it. And in fact, you always put on more than you've lost. So quick returns may not always be a good solution in the long run. I saw someone this week, let's say she's called Katie, and she's around 55, very intelligent lady. And she says, look, you know what? I lost 10 stones following a weight loss plan. I was going to the clubs 
and then my um, sister was going to get married so i had to lose weight so i lost 10 stone but nearly 65 70 kg so she lost over four or five months she had a clear motivation so she had a clear motivation that was a sister's marriage and once the marriage was done and dusted that set motivation was gone and slowly the weight crept up in fact it was not slow in 6 months she regained all the weight and much more obviously she was on a very very low calorie diet and then she told me then after a few years um, my daughter was going to get married and i lost another 9 stones and now she says look i'm planning for a cruise around the world now that covid has gone and things are opening up and the cruise is also opening up i would like to go for a cruise which was one of my plans and it was to tick off this one which is on my bucket list so she says look i did exactly the same thing but now i'm struggling i can't lose weight i used to lose 9 and 10 stones so can you see what she's doing she's always looking for quick return short term motivation and she doesn't have a long term goal she wants to do it for a marriage for a holiday and that's it so i'm not saying that is wrong you should go and enjoy life you should lose weight but why don't you plan ahead and get things sorted out so the second point of why diets fail is we are in search of quick returns the third point is we use food as a crutch it's always a crutch wherever you go emotional eating boredom sadness happiness party family get together you name it it's always a crutch food is a crutch you don't want anything else as a crutch and it's become so easy food is available everywhere is easy to get hold of is cheap so why not so that's another reason for diets to fail because you go for an easy option the fourth one which we discussed was that our body has got a blueprint of a spring so what happens when you stretch a spring it goes back and that's what we are programmed so our genetic makeup is to make sure that we survive we don't die so we got this adaptation so whatever you do our body tries to adapt and the trick as i mentioned before is to make sure that you erase the memory so the trick is to make sure your spring doesn't know how small it was before and for that you need certain tricks and you need to certain speed of weight loss and the speed of weight loss varies from person to person and it also depends upon something called hypothalamic set point that means i don't know if you know that there's a master gland called the pituitary gland which is exactly behind this it's the pituitary gland and the pituitary gland is controlled by another gland called the hypothalamus i'm not sure you know all about this but within the brain there's always a set point and what you need to know is if you want to lose weight and sustain it you need to get to a new set point and you need to make sure you're staying at that set point for some time so that the metabolic memory is erased so your body does not recollect what you were probably 3 4 years ago so that is how you need to do so you're trying to make sure the length of the spring is erased in the genetic blueprint so when you're trying to lose weight make sure you reach that hypothalamic set point and stay on it for some time don't rush for example the lady i mentioned about before she didn't stay on that set point you know as soon as she finished her sister's marriage that's it she forgot every, uh, about everything she changed everything she was back to her usual lifestyle and um, she put on weight and same thing after her daughter's marriage again she did the same thing so she didn't stay on it this is why these 12 week plans and the, sadly most of the research done in weight management is around 12 weeks or maximum 6 months the problem is that's a very short duration the last point i mentioned was medical reasons you need to see an endocrinologist because they have more 
knowledge than the rest of the specialists who deal with these problems. So you need to find out, is there something else going on in my body? I'm doing everything which has been mentioned. I don't follow the crowd. I'm not in for a quick return. I don't use food as a crutch. And I, I'm not into a rapid weight loss, but even then I'm not losing weight. So there must be something else. So this is where the medical thing comes in. When you talk about hormones, you know, everybody, even including doctors, they talk about thyroid. But there are lots of other reasons, lots of other hormonal problems. Menopause could be one. The reason women struggle to lose weight during menopause is one, there's a significant change in their hormonal profile. They lose their muscle mass. Estrogen is down. That makes a big difference. Muscle is the one which burns calories. So having menopause itself can be a big barrier to lose weight. So if you're doing the same old thing, suppose say uh, Amanda did a very low calorie diet when she was 30 and she lost a lot of weight, but now she's 55 and Amanda is trying to do the same old, very low calorie diet, and she goes to the gym. She does four days of HIIT training, which is high intensity interval training, where you do 10 minutes of rapid activity, going on a treadmill, um, pulling up a rope, uh, lifting some heavy weights. So that's high intensity interval training. She did the, exactly the same sort of exercise when she's 55. You know what? doesn't work. She didn't lose weight. Why is that? Because of menopause. That means there's a shift in hormonal balance. She lost her muscle. Losing muscle is a condition called sarcopenia. That means there's less muscle mass. So when you're talking about weight management, it also involves looking into your body composition. So jumping into a diet will not work. And exactly the same thing can be said about men which is called andropause, exactly the same thing. So in men, as they grow older, the percentage of testosterone slowly drops. And when the testosterone drops, they become lethargic, they have a paunch, they lose the muscle mass, the hair growth reduces, they feel dull, withdrawn, they don't uh, socialize. So all these symptoms can happen. And especially men who are bigger, they have more problems. That's because the paunch and the thighs makes the scrotum warm. And then the body, the scrotum thinks, the testicles think that I'm actually I'm inside the body and it doesn't produce testosterone. So andropause in men can lead to weight gain. And if you don't correct the underlying problem, it's very difficult to lose weight. Men start to drop their testosterone with every decade of their life. So someone who is 70 years of age can have really low testosterone. When I talk about testosterone, it's not always about erectile dysfunction. It also is about weight, muscle mass, osteoporosis, and lots of conditions. So andropause is very important for men. And this is why when I see men who are 70s, you know, these days 70s are a very young age. And I have lots of my patients who are around 70. And um, for them, they struggle losing weight because no one's looked into their uh, testosterone levels and pituitary problems. The, another uh, hormonal problem is pituitary. Again, pituitary is a master gland. It produces lots of hormones. It produces too much of cortisol, which is a steroid hormone. That can cause something called Cushing's disease. If you've got hypothalamus problems, which controls the pituitary, then again, your hunger can be altered, your satiety can be altered. I see a number of patients who have had head injury. You know, following head injury, suddenly they feel that their appetite has gone up. It's called hyperphagia. So they feel ravenous. They have to eat big portions. This is all following a head injury or a brain surgery. So that's another group of people who have a hormonal problem because of an injury. The other glands which can cause weight gain, for example, the adrenal gland, which produces, again, cortisol, produces testosterone, it produces adrenaline. So when it produces too much of cortisol, it can give a condition called Cushing's disease syndrome. 
the problem with Cushing syndrome, it's not easy to diagnose. It's very difficult. And trying to do one set of blood tests or one set of urine tests, you can easily miss. And in endocrinology, what I've found in the last 20, 25 years is these glands, they don't just keep producing hormones. Sometimes they're very pulsatile. They may produce hormones and stop for a few months and then start to produce again. So you are likely to miss the diagnosis if the suspicion is not high. So this is why as endocrinologists, we keep checking things again and again when we are suspicious. Pancreas is another um, gland which makes you put on weight. So you must have all, uh, you must know about pancreas because pancreas produces insulin. And if you don't have sufficient insulin, you get type two diabetes. If you don't have insulin at all, you get type 1 diabetes. But what I'm talking about is a condition called insulinoma, which is a tumor of the beta cells in the pancreas, which produces lots of insulin. So it produces so much insulin that you become hungry all the time. You know, you're eating, you had a big meal, and then you eat again, and then after three, four hours, you eat again, and you put on a huge amount of weight. So that's because there's a tumor. It's usually a benign tumor in the pancreas. So can you see that? I've just given you a flavor of the hormonal problems, but actually I've just scratched the surface. So there's lots of hormonal problems which can lead to weight gain. Another um, psychological, uh, the medical problem is, which is psychosomatic. A psychological problem causing a medical problem. So which is very common. And for example, if someone comes with depression and anxiety, that causes increase in cortisol production. The stress causes increase in adrenaline. Stress increases these hormones, adrenaline, noradrenaline, and prevents you from sleeping. And if you don't sleep well, you go and put on weight. So can you see that how they're all related? Psychological problems lead to medical problems, hormonal problems, lack of sleep, weight gain. I think I can't miss this bit. There are some serious life-threatening conditions which can cause weight gain. And uh, in, uh, I mean, we see this quite often. At least once in three months, I come across one or two patients who have been referred for weight management, but I pick up that there's actually a life-threatening condition. And that it's very sad. So some of the life-threatening conditions are liver failure. You know, suddenly you start to become uh, bloated, and you say, oh, I need to lose weight and become more bloated. You say, actually, I'm not eating well. My appetite is not good. Even then, I feel bloated. When you go and do all the tests and scans, you find they have liver failure. Or you find that they've got kidney failure. And some people can have heart failure. Or a silent respiratory failure affecting the right side of the heart. So we see this. So it's very important to pick that up as well. Heart failure liver failure, kidney failure, very, very common. And we, we see this, um, especially in the medical wards, that that particular person has been thinking that I need to lose weight. It's all because of my weight. And finally, we find out it's not the weight. It's actually a problem with one of the organs. Sticking on to medical reasons for weight gain, it seems... Or, of the human population who are on medications, 20% are taking some form of treatment which makes you put on weight. Can you see that, how drastic that is? 20% of us who are taking medications are taking some form of tablets or injections which makes you put on weight. So whilst going in through the weight management plan, you need to find out, are you on a medication which is either increasing your appetite, reducing your metabolism, upsetting your sleep, or there's a problem with absorption. So you need to talk to your doctor. So there are lots of medications, for example, beta blockers. You know, some beta blockers can make you put on weight, make you tired and sluggish. There's a tablet for migraine. You know, it's a very innocent tablet called Pizotifen which prevents migraine. And that makes you put on a lot of weight. A lot of painkillers like gabapentin, pregabalin, antidepressants like sertraline, citalopram, 
So can you see that, that there's a variety of tablets which makes you put on weight? So if you're going for weight management and you want to do it correct before jumping onto any plan, make sure you do all the homework. And uh, what we're going to do is, I know I'm giving you lots of information, but um, I've asked my team to put this across on YouTube. So if you think that you're not um, understood certain things, you can always um, um, reach out to me. And as I mentioned last week, one of the medical reasons for weight gain is hunger pattern. There are at least seven different types of hunger pattern. And if you do not know what type of hunger you've got or a combination of hunger you've got, it's going to be very difficult. Even if you have weight loss surgery, it's going to be difficult to sort that out. Disordered sleep, that's uh, very important. If you're sleeping, you know, we did a poll the other day and I was quite surprised. A lot of people have um, just three hours of sleep and that's not good. You need to put yourself on the top priority. You know, when you get up in the morning, you plan for your food, you plan for your work and you plan for your activities, you plan your holiday. But what I'm asking you now, I'm pleading is, please plan your sleep. You know, plan your sleep. As soon as you wake up, start planning your sleep. Okay, this is the time I'm going to sleep. I'm going to start winding down two hours before. If you don't do it and if you keep postponing it, then you're going to cause permanent damage. So it's very, very important to plan your sleep. Just like you plan your food, plan your activity, please plan your sleep. I know we always think that sleep is just some one of those things where you get knocked off. You just go and lie in the bed or sleep in your chair, keep watching television or binge watching and you just doze off and then you wake up in the morning and run. So I think we don't uh, give enough importance to sleep and that has to change. Man, that's one of the important things in, in the last four or five years. Sleep medicine is becoming very, very important. The last of the medical reasons um, for weight gain and why diets fail is altered gut bacteria. So if you try and um, kill the gut bacteria, you're going to have problems. So, you know, these days there's lots of um, processed food, chemicals, preservatives, all these things kills the gut bacteria. So please make sure that you improve your gut bacteria by taking yogurts, prebiotic, colored vegetables, you know, anything which is colorful, like um, capsicum, um, the green, red, and ones, or the, you know, the purple cabbage, try and have more of those colored vegetables. That will help improve gut bacteria, reduce the processed food. It's very important to cut down on high salt, high sugar. So everybody talks about gut bacteria, you know, the ones I've just said about capsicum, and cabbage, it's all well and good, but you know the science behind it. So now I'm going to talk to you about the science, the endocrinology behind it. So whenever we eat food, you know, people think that food has to go into your mouth and then our saliva, uh, salivary gland produces saliva and then our stomach produces some hormones, then our small intestine produces hormones and that's how it works. But there's a constant talk, you know, they're chattering. The brain is communicating with the intestine, the stomach, and they're talking all the time, every minute. But in fact, research shows that the talk, the gut-brain talk starts as soon as you smell food. As soon as you look at food and smell food, the whole chitter-chatter starts. So, and immediately the hormones are produced by the salivary gland, and now we know it also depends upon the speed of movement of food in the gullet, that is the esophagus. So all these things matters. And the way the gut and the brain talk is also controlled by neurohormones, the medications, food, and most importantly, gut bacteria. So if the gut bacteria, you know, there are millions of bacteria in the gut, and if, even if they move by a millimeter during the night, 
that produces lots of hormones. So the millimeter movement of the whole colony of bacteria can tell your brain to actually produce certain hormones for fullness. This is where when you're sleeping or you don't sleep or you have uh, say late night Chinese meal, that can affect your gut bacteria and the next day you feel unwell. The reason is that colony of bacteria has moved, probably it's unhappy with your Chinese uh, takeaway and that stole the brain, the brain has uh, um, sent some signals, then there is some hormones produced which make, feel, make you feel bloated. So don't be surprised when you feel bloated. The reason we feel bloated is because the gut brain have spoken to one another and they've told that we're not happy with this guy who's feeding us with all these um, rubbish. So you need to be aware, start thinking about it, introspect of what you do. Okay, so we have caught up on what we discussed, why people fail on diets. But last time, as I said, I don't think you should uh, beat yourself for this or beat yourself for what you've done. Let's say it's not diet failure, it's diet unresponsiveness. You have not responded to the diet and let's just forget that and move on. And that should be your attitude. Your attitude should not be to feel guilty. Your attitude should be to say, okay, at that point in time, this is what this is the information I had, and that's why I did it. Okay, let's put that back, let's park it, and let's move on. So the first step is to be kind to yourself. Don't feel guilty. And that's what we teach in Simply Weight, is never feel guilty. Okay, so before I go and go on to the next, I'm going to put a poll to see what actually you have learned. And I'm going to launch this. So to lose weight and keep it off, what will you do? So you eat less, will you exercise more, or eat less and exercise more, or follow a, a very low calorie diet. So I mean, you can only choose one answer in this. You can't choose everything. You have you want to make your for your mind as to what you will do. So you want to eat less and excess more. So okay, we got a few more people um, to give their answers. Okay, so we got uh, okay. So I'm going to end the poll now, and let's share the results. So I can see that 50% say they'll eat less and excess more. That's very good. I was actually expecting 100%. So that clearly tells me um, you're changing. So you're moving away from the diet culture. And then someone said, okay, I eat less. But how less? You can't keep to eating very little. You've got to eat. And then 40% say that's other. So that's the other is the one I, which I was talking about, other than eating and exercise. You need to focus on that. Eating and exercise should come as if you're driving on a motorway. You know, when you're driving on a motorway, what happens when you drive on a motorway? You plan ahead, kick start, and then on the motorway, you're actually thinking about lots of things. What's happened during the day? What are you going to do tomorrow? and what movie you will watch, and what's on Netflix. And um, you'll be thinking of, okay, there's another service station coming. I'm going to have um, say Burger King or KFC. So that's the thought. No one is thinking, should I press my feet on the gas, or should I put a brake, or is uh, someone going to overtake me? No, no one's thinking about all these things. So. The whole idea of driving on the motorway is an automatic process. You know what? Sometimes it so happens that you think, oh, I got to go to the loo. And then suddenly some thought comes and you miss that service station. And the urge to pass urine goes away. And you're still driving and they say, oh, I missed the service station. I need to go to the next service station. So that's what happens when you're on a motorway and you're uh, 
good driver who's been driving for a long time. And that is what I want you to do as far as weight management is concerned. I don't want you to think what you're doing, especially food and activity. It should be part and parcel. You should be doing it. It should be ingrained. What you need to be thinking about is, you need to be thinking about your planning your sleep, planning how you'll deal with stress, thinking about how your body is reacting to certain types of food, and that is what you need to be thinking. So the food and exercise should be just part of your whole um, lifestyle. You shouldn't, be, you shouldn't even think about it. And it should be ingrained. You don't need to allow two hours to go to the gym. You know, when you allow two hours to go to the gym, what happens is you may not get that two hours. You may get one hour and suddenly you'll think, oh, I don't have the two hours, so I'm not going to the gym, going to the gym today. And so you come back from work and um, you haven't planned well. So you find that there's no food and you've got to cook from scratch. So the first thing you do is open up the biscuit tin and have the first 10 chocolate digestive biscuits. And you think, okay, I'm not hungry now. I'll just wait for some time, pour a glass of wine and then watch some episode and think, oh, I'm hungry again. And then you think, oh, it's too late. Let me have another 10 chocolate biscuits. That's what happens. That's happened. That happens to everybody. So planning and getting everything into your life. It should be as if you're brushing your teeth. You don't have to think. And that's the key. Okay, I'm going to now get on to the 10 reasons to avoid diet and responsiveness. So the first one, as I mentioned, be kind to yourself. Put your energy, put your thought into something nice. Think about if someone came to you and told you that, okay, I've got this problem, you've got to be kind to them. So why not be kind to yourself? That's the first step and avoid being guilty. You know, the reason why I keep mentioning this and repeating the word guilt, as soon as you feel guilty, you are on a slippery slope because guilt is a nasty sort of uh, emotion because it gives you a sense of escapism. So if I did something wrong and I tell my colleagues, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do this. I didn't turn up. I didn't do this job. So everybody is going to say, oh, Raj is very guilty. He's showing remorse. So we let him go. So what happens is I have in my brain that if you feel guilty, you are let off. So that's the, the emotion. Of, the guilt emotion is not a good emotion. Because as soon as you start feeling guilty, you get excused. And then you're on a slippery slope. Say, suppose you say, oh, I don't feel well. I'm not going to come to the party. But in fact, what is going on is you think, oh, I don't want to mingle with these guys. Uh, I don't have a nice fitting dress today. So I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to say, oh, I don't feel well. And you tell them that you've got too much work. You don't feel well. And that's it. Can you see that? How you're moving away. Whenever you give this excuse of guilt or feeling sorry, that's a slippery slope. Don't do it. Be kind and face. Face people. And don't procrastinate. It's very important. The second point is find a motivation. When I mean a motivation, I'm not talking about the other lady who said my daughter's married. That's, that's okay. It's okay to have a motivation. But when you build a long-term motivation or a short-term motivation, you break it. Break it into lots of non-weight-related goals. So let us say, um, let's go back to the same lady who says that I'm going for my daughter's marriage. So within the daughter's marriage, she should break it down. She should say, okay, I'm going to socialize and uh, I'm going to plan this outing. When I go and buy a dress for my daughter, I'm going to make sure that this is what I'm going to eat. And I'm going to make sure that I do some exercise to reduce my waist circumference so that I fit my dress. So I'm going to get up one hour early and do some yoga. You need to fit in. Okay, 
the motivation for this lady was daughter's marriage, but she's using this opportunity and she should get other non-weight related goals done. So that is the key. The, the trick is trying to build things, you know. No, don't try to allot too many hours into weight management. It won't work because we all got our own lives to look after. We got our work, we got our family to look after. There are lots of other things we need to do. So weight, you can't be fixated with weight. You, you don't have hours and hours to do this. You have to fit in. Fit in with your lifestyle and that's the trick. And the trick is to break it down to the small non-weight related goals. It could be a very silly non-weight related goal, but you have to do it. So the third point is you need to instill process and habits and not just have a goal weight. <coughs> so, you know, I just mentioned about brushing your teeth. You need to instill in habits. And people say habits take 21 days. That's uh, nonsense. It depends on what type of habit it is. It may take up to six months or three months. It's different from person to person. So you need to instill a process. You know, some people who do very well on a particular um, weight loss plan, the reason they have done well in that particular plan is they've changed the whole lifestyle. It was not that particular plan which helped them. They used that plan to change their life. And that is why they became successful. But no one looks at that. They always look at the before and after picture. So if you want to know what exactly happens on the behind the scenes is because they changed their habits, they changed the process. When you do this, you also alter the neurohormones. Say, for example, you get up half an hour early. Every day you get up half an hour early and you do about 15 minutes of freehand exercise. You know what? There's a change in the way your hormones are produced. The way the cortisol is produced, melatonin is produced in the night, suddenly that changes. So this, this half an hour can make a huge difference to how you feel, what time you sleep, everything it changes. So you need to make small changes. Don't go for drastic changes. As soon as you go for drastic changes, you know the spring, it pull you back. So don't go for drastic changes. And as I mentioned before, you need to find out the why. Determine the underlying reason for weight gain. So are you following the crowd? Are you wanting a quick solution? Or is it a medical reason? So what type of hunger you've got? So all these are the why, try to find out. The fifth point is identify barriers. You know, that you need to be ruthless in this. That's what I tell my patients and I also tell my doctors, if you want to really conquer something, you need to be ruthless. Identifying barriers is very, very important. You know, so who is the barrier or what is the barrier? The barriers can be human beings. Barriers can be environment. So it could be your own partner or husband who is a feeder. You know, uh, your partner could be thinking that, okay, I just want her to be happy, so I'm going to feed her. I mean, the intention may be good. Don't get me wrong. The intention may be good. And probably the partner likes you as you are. They don't really care whether you're big or small. They just want, they just love you. They don't care, but you are more worried about your health and your looks. So your partner is a barrier, but you, you need to be ruthless, be kind to your partner, and you need to learn to say no. So in simply way, that's what we do. Is one of the things is teaching to say no. If you do not know how to say no, then it's very difficult to lose weight. Same thing in, at workplace, you know, it's, uh, it's usually a fashion of uh, birthdays are celebrated with chocolates and cakes. And we all want a reason to open up a chocolate box or uh, in hospitals, I don't know if you know that we get uh, presents from gifts from patients and there's always two or three boxes of chocolates open on the nurses um, area and everybody walks around, picks up a chocolate. It becomes a, 
sort of every, every patient you have two small chocolate bars. So can you see who is the barrier? The barrier is someone who's putting the chocolate over there. The barrier could be your partner, barrier could be your colleagues, but you need to say no. You need to give an excuse. Like you need to give an excuse such, as, such that you don't offend other person and give a reason. Identifying barrier and also the environment. You know, if, you're, if your house is in, in, a, in a way, which is arranged in such a way that when you enter the house, the first thing you enter is the woody area of the house. Naturally, you're going to open up the cupboard and pop in a few nuts and chocolates. So you need to make sure that it's not easily accessible. So this is just a few examples. So you need to learn to throw the crutch. So the crutch is the food. And you need to be ruthless in getting rid of your barriers. When I say getting rid of barriers, I don't say get rid of your partner. All I'm saying is try to say no or explain to your partner, please help me, get your partner on board, tell your partner, look, let's do this. And if you, even if you don't want to do it, let me do it, can you help me? When you do this, suddenly you find that your outcomes are very good. And as I mentioned in the last webinar, there are seven different types of hunger pattern. You need to understand your body and hunger. The seventh point is, you know, weight, when weight gain, is called ABCD. It's not called obesity anymore, and it's a wrong word. And um, we have started to use the word ABCD, which is adiposity based chronic disease. You know, adipose, adipose is anything to do with fat, fat tissue. So it's a fat tissue based chronic disease. And can you see the word chronic? I'm emphasizing on the word chronic. So be kind to yourself. Just like your kind, when you have um, a chest infection, you wait for some time and you get rid of the chest infection, you still have this cough and that drags on for a few weeks. So it goes for a long time. And people who have diabetes, it's a chronic disease. You don't get upset when the sugar slightly goes up. You just think, oh, it's gone up. Okay, I'm going to sort things out. And that's how weight is. If you think it's a chronic problem and I'm going to get myself sorted, but I'm going to keep an eye on it all the time, then you're a winner. So if you can think about weight problem as A, B, C, D, you're going to be happy, you know? So I don't have mentioned this. There's a lady who has gained, a, gained one kilogram in weight and she's really, really upset now that she's gained a kilogram in weight. You don't even notice. No one is going to notice one kilogram gain in weight, but the person is upset. But if you understood that it's a chronic problem, weight will go up and down. You know, for some uh, women around the menstrual period, they can gain up to five kilograms, 10 pounds weight gain. That's massive. 10 pound weight gain is a huge amount. And you don't gain weight just by eating food. So um, that amount of weight gain is due to changes in the hormones, fluid retention. So the eighth point for success and to prevent um, failure with diets is time management. You know, you cannot succeed in weight management if you cannot sort out time management. So if suppose you're telling me that I don't have time, I'm such a busy person, and um, do, you need to give me something where I can lose weight immediately and I don't have to spend any time, then I'm sorry you're not going to succeed. People who tell me you don't, they don't have time, what they're telling me is that weight management is not my priority. So I'm not, I don't blame my patients. I, I'm very empathetic to everybody. And I understand with my experience, I know what they're trying to tell me when someone tells me they don't have time, they're clearly telling me at this point in time, weight loss is not my priority. Everything else is my priority. Um, I'll just tell you, uh, this happened just before I started a webinar. There's a GP who rang me frantically. I was actually seeing patients on um, a video call and this GP um, rang me three times whilst in that 10-minute um, uh, period, he rang me three times 
And then I picked up the call after I finished seeing the patient. And he said, look, um, I've just found out that I've had a myocardial infarction. That's heart attack. I need to do something now. You know, I've been, I've known him for at least 10 years. And I've always been telling him, look, you need to sort this out. He says, no, no, no. You know what? I've got two, three sessions. I go in the morning at seven o'clock. I come back at eight o'clock. I see 40, 50 patients. Then I do home visits. Then I have to do um, uh, the teach my uh, the junior registrars and the GP registrars. Then I have to look after the family and my parents. So I don't have time. And suddenly now, since he has had a heart attack, all that has gone off through the roof, his patients, his father, his mother, his wife, and now his priority is weight loss. So can you see how the priority changes in life? So you need to be careful when you set your priorities. So don't give an excuse of time management. That means if you're not losing weight, if you don't have enough time to lose weight, that means you're not managing your time correctly, you're not putting your priorities right. So you need to sit down and before you make a diet plan or sleep plan, find out all the useless things you did today. I'm sure you'll come up with at least 10 different things, useless things which you have spent two or three hours. You know, For example, five minutes of looking at WhatsApp or 20 minutes of looking at um, uh, what did Boris Johnson tell Putin? What's happening with the Ukrainian war? I mean, how are you bothered? I know, I know we're all interested in that. But the thing is, you don't need to spend hours and hours on it. So if you can write down at the end of the day, how many hours you have spent you, wasting your time, you can get rid of them and suddenly you'll find that you're managing your time better. So time management is critical. And as I mentioned before, Sleep medicine is getting its priority and you need to sort your sleep. Please plan your sleep. Just like you plan your time, plan your sleep. And the last and the final one is you need to celebrate and share your success. You know what? I'm not talking about weight loss. You need to celebrate and share your success when you reach any of these things. Suppose you managed your time well. Suppose you slept well. You found out who are the barriers. You threw out one of the food crutches. Everything is a success. You know, each one is a small battle you have won. And you need to share it. You need to shout loud and tell everybody, look, I've, gone, I've won this battle. And when you do this repeatedly every day, you try to consolidate the battle you've done or won. And then that's how you win the war. And you win the war permanently. So celebrate success, share with your colleagues or partner, tell them, don't keep it a secret. Tell everybody what you did. Can you see that in the last 10 points I mentioned, how to be successful, I never spoke about what food you should eat. I never said what exercise you should do. Without even talking about food and activity, I covered 10 points, which is going to change your life. So please realize that weight management has changed in the last decade and you need to change as well. So before I wind up, as I usually say, please invest an hour every day. Invest one hour of your life every day. So you've got 24 hours in a day, one hour you invest on yourself. Spending on one hour just listening to, you know, the talks I give, go to the YouTube videos, read good articles, talk to your friends, share your success, spend some time with activity, plan your food, plan your sleep. So you just spend one hour and that's the best investment you would have made. And thank you for being patient and listening. Bye now. To join our webinar events, Visit our website www.simplyweight.co.uk and scroll down to the footer page. Click the button Events Calendar. Our webinar replay events are displayed on the calendar form Tuesdays to Sundays. Click the link in the event description to view the webinar.
Our upcoming webinar events are displayed on the calendar. Use the Zoom link to join the webinar on the day of the event.